The Unshackled Waves, episode 165. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. We haven't had a review of Australian politics for a couple of weeks now. That's because the past parliamentary sitting fortnight has been dominated by tax policy. The Turnbull government successfully passed its income uh, tax cut package uh, through the Senate. However, it failed to gain enough uh, crossbench support for its uh, full company tax cuts. And Bill Shorten seemed uh, to send out very mixed messages when it, when it came to what he would do on tax policy. Joining me for a taxathon special, I welcome back to the show the Unshackled political editor michael smyth michael welcome back to the show thank you tim uh, now as i mentioned in my introduction uh we didn't have you on last week just because the political discussion it's mainly consumed around uh, tax policy both income and company tax cuts so we thought we'd come back uh, this week and dedicate the the show solely to tax because it seems to be where uh, the, the the main political uh, battleground is at the moment very much so. The for past couple of weeks have basically been, uh, well, actually past month, you could argue, has been a foray into the uh, the intrigues going on within political parties, particularly in one nation, but also in Labour to a point, because you've got, now you've got Albanese somewhat walking a line between criticising Labour policy and outright gunning for Shorten. Yeah, both sides are tearing themselves apart uh, when it comes to tax policy, but let's focus mm. on uh, the Turnbull government's victory last week, which was their income tax cut package, which was announced in the, the federal budget. Now, they passed all three stages of their seven-year uh, income tax package, uh, negotiated it through the Senate. Uh, they did it as an all-or-nothing vote, so they, they wanted to wedge Labor to say, well, if you uh, are going to vote this down, you're going to deny low- and middle-income people uh, a tax uh, cut. Now, uh, I think it's pretty ridiculous to legislate for something seven years into the future because we'll have two elections in the the meantime we don't know who the government will be that uh, i'd say there's hardly uh, any certainty but it's it's the standard political tactic these days to lock in a future government into your policies mm. and booby trapping the books has been a favorite pastime of outgoing governments both labor and liberal uh, the success that they managed to have last week the coalition that is with the um packaging of all the tax cuts at a, at one stage and into one bill has made it a lot harder for shorten to say no we're not going to support this but then there's still the issue of the company tax cuts as well so but we'll touch on that later yeah and so the the chief uh, negotiator in the the Senate, Matthias Corman, he he had a big win. the The final vote was thirty seven to thirty three. He got one nation over the line, which, as we know, has been quite uh, difficult lately. Now, stage one, it gives a, a five hundred and thirty dollar uh, tax cut to low and middle income earners. Then stage two comes in twenty twenty two from July 1, uh, which will uh, bring down the tax rate to people earning 90 to 120,000 uh, per year to 32 and a half cents in the dollar. And then stage three, which comes in at 2024 onwards, uh, all those earning between 40, 41,000 and 200,000 will pay uh, also 32.5 cents in the dollar. Now, uh, Labor, this is the uh, the stage two and three is the tax package Labor has said they're going to repeal uh, if they're elected to, to government. That there was a lot of research involved in, the, in this episode. You've got to make sure that you get the, the tax uh, brackets all, all right and also uh, which ones Labor's going to repeal and which ones they've said they're, they're not. But Labor has said, yes, they will uh, repeal those. Mm -hmm. Which is... Which is a bit hypocritical of them to say that because that's 
probably what they would do in seven years from now if they happen to be in government anyway. It, the thing is, if you continue to burden the individual taxpayer, you're not going to have any massive increases in consumption, which means fewer businesses will be able to thrive, fewer businesses will start up, and there'll be fewer savings as well. And you, you're just not going to get anywhere. So these income tax cuts may not seem like a good idea to people who say, oh, we need to pay down the debt and the deficit now. But at the same time, there are other ways to skin a cat, as it were. If you stimulate the economy by giving the, the individuals, the working people, an opportunity to save more money, that means they'll likely spend more money and then put money back into the economy that way. Oh, yeah, you don't need to uh, t tell me about uh, how, how good uh, income tax and company tax relief is uh, for, for the economy. Uh, but uh, Labor, as we know, they're, they're in class war uh, mode. Uh, uh, Bill, Bill Shorten has said to business, you'll get nothing from me that inequality is going to be the centrepiece of any future uh, Labor government. And they, they also want to uh, reinstate the, the, the debt levy, which would uh, take uh, put back up the uh, highest uh, income tax rate to 49%. Every time, I mean, you know, I'm going to sound libertarian here when I say this, but every time the government says something is just a temporary measure, it's 96, 97% of the time, it's it becomes a permanent measure. The funny thing was, I was reading in the Australian yesterday from a friend of mine who is a retired journalist that Albanese is actually seen as a more business friendly leader amongst the Labour Party party room than Shorten is, which is funny because Albo is from the left and you'd expect him to be You'd expect him to be the one saying all the stuff. And let's that not forget say. that uh, Shorten's had a, quite a privileged upbringing himself. Oh, he's very privileged. I mean, there's a reason why Peter Credlin referred to him as Mr. Harborside Mansions. Mm. And so, when we use the word privilege, like we actually are talking about legitimate privilege. Exactly. Well, I'm sure most of our listeners understand that. They're not going to be snowflakes and think that, um, uh, privilege or anything along those lines. So we might move on to the other part of the, the tax uh, discussion, which was the, the company tax cuts. Now, they've uh, failed to uh, get through the, the Senate. This was basically because uh, uh, One Nation leader uh, Pauline Hanson uh, reversed her support for it. She's now 100% opposed to it, which ended up costing her uh, a senator with uh, Brian Burston uh, eventually forced out, then saying he was going to be an independent, then going over to Clive's new uh, United uh, Australia Party. Now, there's already uh, com uh, tax cut, company tax cuts legislated for small and uh, medium-sized uh, businesses, but uh, the, the government, they want to bring the, the tax rate down for all companies to 25%. And uh, Matthias Cormann, the, the finance minister, said uh, at a press conference, we're delaying it until after the the Super Saturday uh, by elections. And Matthias Cormann, he is known as uh, as quite an unflappable, calm, uh, steady person. And when I saw his press conference on on Thursday, he 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 almost. I think he lost his temper. He, he, he lashed out at One Nation saying, look, One Nation supporters in Longman, which is uh, one of the, the by-election seat, their, their supporters uh, have a, a, a higher approval of the, the company tax cut than coalition uh, vo uh, voters, and, and also lashed out at, at Bill Shorten saying that he, he was most anti-business uh, leader you can imagine he's he's misleading the the Australian people when he talks about giveaways to, to big business and you media you're you're basically covering for him it was quite a fiery press conference by Matthias Corman standards <laughs> I thought yes even the most patient of us seem to have a line have a limit rather and Paul I actually feel a little bit sorry for Matthias. He hit he 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 was pushed to his limit and then he snapped. It's because the fa the fact is okay, and this isn't a fact, this is a theory. The theory I've had, because I as you know, I have quite a few friends across the political spectrum and several in several parties. 
Well, one of the things that one of my suspicions about the One Nation Party reneging on the company tax cuts wasn't just a way of putting the coalition on notice, it was also a way to try and force Burston out because Burston was clearly in favour of the company tax cuts. So he. That's quite a uh, 5D chess move by Hanson, if that was their strategy all along. I can't get into that. Um, let, let's just say I have a theory and leave it at that. Mm. I'm sure my friends inside One Nation would be rather annoyed if I were to disclose what I actually knew. But that aside, Burston has always been pro-business. Um whether it be big business or small business. Pauline Hansen, to her credit, fights for small business, fights for the little guy, or at least that's what the... Um, well, she says she her. was a fish and chip shop owner. Mm -hmm. Apparently the fish and chips were quite good, according to a uh, local journalist that I used to know when I was in school. <laughs> but anyway, um, I love my fish and chips, so, you know, <laughs> I'm always amenable to people who make good fish and chips. The thing is, though, with the company tax cuts, what Bill Shorten was saying, making when he made his captain's call to say, oh, I'm going to repeal the tax cuts for businesses between 10 and $50 million. Yeah, that was on the Tuesday. Mm -hmm. That was a stupid move by Shorten, and I have no qualms about saying that publicly, because... Would you call it a brain snap that he just blurted out what he thought was the right policy? It could have been a it could have been a brain snap because when did Albo start making his comments to uh, criticize? That that was before that was that was last week when he uh, railed against the the anti business uh, rhetoric. Mm -hmm. So maybe well it, yeah I pro in that case I probably say it was a brain snap from Sean because Sean usually considers everything he says before saying it. I mean, he has his PR machine working 24 seven to put out the best press releases, best, most catchy uh, slogans and such. Plus who can forget his propensity to zingers. Oh yeah, I'll give him credit. His zingers uh, most of the time are, are quite good, but uh, this, <laughs> Uh, this was from, not a zinger, this was yeah, a brain snap. <laughs> yeah, well, this uh, brain snap, it made the, the business community freak out saying, how can we have certainty? And uh, we, we both know that uh, the, the business uh, l lobby, that when they legitimately get get freaked out, I mean, they're, they're, they're pretty tame most of the time, then that, that means they're, <laughs> they're, they're pretty uh, concerned. And then there was the, uh, the famous uh, radio interview with uh, the member for Bass uh, Labor, Ross Hart, uh, which is a seat in Tasmania, was on a local Tasmanian radio station, which uh, it, was, it was referred to as a classic uh, train wreck uh, interview, where the interviewer asked, uh, do, you, do you support these, uh, uh, what your leader has said? And he's like, oh, Bill, Bill has said this, uh, we're, we're going to uh, consider uh, the, uh, this policy. And of course, the interviewer was right on his game saying, oh, so you don't support what he said. And yeah, that, that's what the, the whole interview <laughs> <laughs> uh, was and it, it wasn't just backbenchers; it was uh, front benches as well. Uh, Chris, uh, Chris Bowen had a difficult interview with Alan Jones as well, uh, and even uh, Tanya Plibersek, uh, the the hard left, uh, she was she didn't know which how to handle it. Mm -hmm. Plibersek still waiting in the wings as well for when Shorten decides to step down or gets pushed, but it will probably be a resignation rather than him being pushed out, given the rules that Kevin Rudd put in in 2013. It's almost like it's a rule that's going to be broken, where obviously Shorten has a stranglehold on the, the leadership uh, position. He lost the, the membership vote, but he got the, the factions, including the, the left and the CF, uh, MMEU to support his uh, leadership. So that, that's what's keeping him in at the moment and that he's crush all uh, opposition. That's why uh, 
even he, he was prepared to uh, cast same Dastyari aside, even though he was a numbers man, because he, he was a threat to him becoming uh, prime minister. I mean, short, uh, uh, David Maher is right when he calls him a, a faction man. That's that's why he's still there. Mm. But uh, the Super Saturday by-elections may change that. Shorten's position hasn't improved in, within the Labour Party because the increase in support from the membership has has been offset by a decrease in support from within the party room and the factions, as strange as that might sound. So his position is now the same as it was in 2013. But he couldn't win in 2016. He, If he keeps on having brain snaps like the one he had on Tuesday, he's not going to win next year either, at the, or whenever they hold the general election, because it's... How do, how do you consider $10 million a large business? That's that, that's a medium size. That's still a medium sized enterprise when you think about it. And of course, on the, the Friday, that's when um, Will Shortney basically w was happy for his shadow cabinet to uh, roll him and said that he regretted taking that position and basically conceded it was best to lose a bit of political capital now and just uh, correct uh, this policy. And so the, uh, the already legislated uh, company tax cuts uh, will remain. He would have eaten some uh, humble pie, uh, Bill Shorten, but uh, it's given the, uh, the Turnbull government a lot of ammunition to uh, attack uh, uh, Short, uh, Shorten's authority, given that yeah, he he pretty much said said, said to his party and his uh, front bench, yeah, just go ahead, I'll just roll over. Mm. This is actually an opportunity. This is also an opportunity for Turnbull as well. You mentioned the ammunition. It's also an opportunity for Turnbull because of the fact that he can say in question time or even to the media, oh, Bill Shorten used to attack Tony Abbott for making captain's calls but unlike the captain calls that tony abbott made he, bill shorten's captain calls aren't even supported by his party i mean to say something like, along those lines oh, yeah and of course it also keep abbott quiet mm. simmering and, yeah and quiet. like or hate like turnbull i mean his his cabinet and the uh, the backbench they are happy with uh, the way he consults there's there's not not many captain's calls from uh, Malcolm Turnbull, so he actually does come from a position of authority, saying, "I'm the consultative one. I uh, f uh, seek advice widely. I don't make rash decisions like that." Mm. Well, that too, he can say that as well. That would actually be safer for him in order to um, keep the lid on tensions in the uh, the Liberal Party party room, at least. Um. There was something else I was going to say um, in regards to that. The Liberal Party tends to be a lot better at hiding its internal um, issues when it comes close to an election time. It's only after the election that the issues start to slowly reemerge. Whereas the Labour Party does have a thing of saying, as does have uh, a habit The Liberal of Party is getting quite good at that, I think, uh, given what's been going on in uh, branches all around the nation. Oh, you mean the stacking? <laughs> oh, well, uh, given that it's, uh, it turned into a full-on brawl at uh, one uh, New South Wales Liberal Party meeting. Oh, that thing. Yeah, I wasn't quite clear on what happened there. Some people were saying it was just a personal thing. Some people were saying it was a religious thing. Some people were saying it was a political thing. It's, like, it's probably a combination of all three. All, all three... Well, that, um, that's what I'm trying to get at. I'm not, I'm not that certain that Liberal Party is good at keeping its internal house in order. Yeah, but they're not fighting a by-election down there. Mm. They've, with the Liberal Party, sorry, the Liberal National Party, is fighting a by-election in Longman. And so far they look like they're tipped to win, on, albeit on preferences. Uh, but we will have to cover that more during our Super Saturday special because there is a lot to go over, which we won't have time to do tonight. The backflip that Sean did however has crippled his position and we've already established that but we haven't established how much it has crippled him 
the fact that he's made a massive blunder like this, he's burned through a lot more political capital than he was planning to when he did his his mayor culpa on Friday. He's got he's got a worry now that the other pretenders to the Labour leadership will be looking at the by elections, and if he loses, not just um, not just in Longman, but if he loses in Braddon and he mm. loses in Perth, they're behind in in both uh, Longman and Braddon. Last time polling was done in both of them. Mm, mm, that's right, yeah. and if one and if what. I've read today suggesting that One Nation will preference the LNP yeah. is correct, which I don't think it is. I don't think One Nation will actually pick a side, to be honest. Oh, well, pro- Pauline Hanson, she's pretty pissed off at those uh, robocalls uh, that uh, uh, say that uh, she's in uh, in bed with the, the coalition over uh, tax policy. Yes, but, but that might be even more reason for her not to preference either of the major parties. Like the Greens did in 2010, they didn't preference, at least in the seat of Griffith, they didn't preference either of the major parties. Because if she does preference the LNP, then the Labour Party like, ha, ah, told you, told you, called it. We told you she was a Liberal Party um, Liberal Party supporter, sympathiser, whatever you want to put it, whatever you want to call it. And, you know, so, I don't know. I mean, if I were Pauline right now, yes, I'd be very upset with the Labour Party too for, you know, cheap tricks, but, well, not so cheap tricks in the case of the Labour Party. Robocalls are quite expensive, but she could do the counter option and just say, if you want a preference, ultimately, Labour or Liberal have two options, rather, like a red option and a blue option, rather than a, um, uh, than just saying one or the other. And it's also worth uh, going back to Matthias Cormann. He nearly made a huge gaffe of himself saying that the by-elections would be a, a referendum on uh, both parties competing economic visions. And you, you don't want to do that. Uh, well, yeah, it's okay to take to an election, but not in by-elections, which it's still going to be uh, very unlikely that that you'll win. I mean, the statistics always point out that the government's never won a by-election from the opposition since 1920. You don't want to basically put your credibility on the line like that. Mm. But that's true. But at the same time, people are genuinely worried about the the breadcrumbs that we are getting over the next six or seven years. And the fact is that. Australians seem to have this instinct, instinctive knowledge that when the times when times are tough economically, stick with the Liberals simply because they're slightly better at managing the economy and saving money. So yeah. it, it, that could be the reason why he made that statement. I mean, I wouldn't have done it if I'd been in Corman's place, but I can understand why he might have thought it was a good idea at the time to say that. Yeah, that, that, that was the uh, Coalition's brain snap moment of the week. <laughs> They've had a few, actually, but that's probably the most obvious one. Uh, now, of course, uh, uh, as we were mentioning before, Labor's really ramping up their, the, the class warfare with their attack ads against Malcolm Turnbull, basically saying he uh, stands to uh, benefit personally from the company tax cut because he has shares in a whole bunch of things. And But then uh, it sort of blew up in their face when it was uh, revealed by the, the Daily Telegraph that uh, Malcolm Turnbull donates his uh, $500,000 prime ministerial salary to charity. He's he's doing this job for free. Well, he probably makes more from his dividends than he does as being prime, than from being prime minister. I mean, the guy's worth $200 million. So, you know, $500,000 a year, he can afford to give that away. Mm. But, but yeah, yeah it's... It, it is blatant class warfare on the part of the Labour Party. But the fact that the... Um, excuse me... The fact that someone actually let slip, by the way, he actually gives away the money to charity, makes people think, okay, maybe he is human after all, and it actually makes Labor look really hypocritical. And he, and he didn't, that... um, like, doesn't showboat it at all. Like, um, 
uh, a Donald Trump does the the big photo where he like gives his paycheck to a uh, a charity while well, Malcolm Turnbull is doing doing this uh, all along and hasn't told us. Hmm. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, if it's true, then credit to him for that because a lot of people wouldn't give away half a million uh, on a. I don't win. think Shorten could cope with that. He is a parliamentary salary. Sean, Shorten's only in it for himself. Sean doesn't give a damn about the workers. I mean, neither does Turnbull. But at this, at, in this instance, I'm going to give Turnbull a free kick here on Shorten because of the fact that Shorten claims to be a man of the people working. He's a lawyer who used to be involved with very, very affluent members of society. And... How much does he give to charity? You know, that could be another line of attack that Turnbull could use on Shorten. You know, lash out at them over their robocall campaign and the um, um, all the other stuff that they've been saying. I mean, if Malcolm Turnbull was serious at the New South Wales, uh, sorry, the the federal uh, Liberal uh, Council that was held in New South Wales, that never again would we allow Labor to get away with lies such as uh, Mediscare. I mean, they've got to get way more aggressive in this uh, by-election campaign and basically hit back at, at, at Labor's uh, attack ads. Mm. That's, that's one weakness the Liberal Party has. As always had when before I was in it, when I was in it, and after I left, it has always been. A, they've always seen themselves as more sophisticated rather than just plain. They don't like to play dirty. Mm. So as a result, that's why you see a lot more negative ads from the Labor Party than you do from the coalition. Even when the coalition is in opposition you will still see their ads will be somewhat sophisticated and civil rather than just, oh, you can't trust Turnbull or you can't trust Abbott, you can't trust this, that, and the other. But uh, as we mentioned, it's more a sign of uh, desperation because Labor are behind. And if Shorten goes backwards, if he goes from, they're on 69 seats at the moment to the coalition's uh, 76, uh, if they, if they if it becomes 78 uh, 67 then that's a huge blow to uh, shorten and it, it is a uh, a direct uh, uh, what's uh, what's the word a blow to uh, his uh, his image or as uh, the alternative prime minister because if he can't win or retain labor seats how's he going to win enough to form government exactly right I mean, this is the thing. When I was, I had a meeting with some friends on Thursday night, and what we discussed was, what are your thoughts on Shorten's future if he loses in Longman? And they basically all said, either it won't affect him because Longman's a swing seat, or it will affect him if he loses two other seats in addition to Longman. So, like I said. If he loses Longman, Braddon, and Perth, then Sean should be sleeping with one eye open, so to speak, because Plibersek, Albo, and maybe even Bowen, potentially, if he has it in him, might be looking at re um, realigning the Labour Party caucus. But if he only loses Longman and Braddon, he will probably be safe for now, notwithstanding the incredibly difficult task of replacing a sitting Labour leader anyway. Uh, Albanese is, he's tried to be the, the smiling assassin. He's, it's very <laughs> nice sniping. I mean, uh, Tony Abbott, it clearly comes across as uh, very <laughs> vindictive and uh, salty when, when he's sniping, but Albanese is like, oh, this is, you know, my vision. You're, you're, you're happy to, to take it. And uh, he's, he's very clever the, the, the way that uh, he does this. And yes, he did win the, the, the members uh, vote. So he, he could uh, win, win another. He could. Um, it's going to be interesting to see if and when Albanese makes his move. Because I, 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 when I wrote for Menzies House in 2013, I actually said that, and this is a bit of a segue and a bit of a digression, but 
I actually wrote that the Labour Party would have been better off with Albanese's leader than Shorten. Because of the fact that if Albanese had been leader against Turnbull in 2016, Labour would have won the election. If Abbott, if Abbott had still been leader of the Liberal Party, Albanese probably still would have won, but it would have been similar to the situation just uh, that we had in 2016, just reversed. It would have been a very narrow victory, but Albanese would have won. And because Abbott and Albanese are two very, very similar people uh, in terms of their temperaments, not in terms of their politics, they're whole miles apart, but in terms of their temperaments and their passion, they are very similar. If they weren't in politics, they'd probably be good friends. I think that... I think that the Super Saturday significance is not to be underestimated in the sense that it will set the tone of debate between the major parties, regardless of who wins what, it will still set the tempo. It is, in a way, Corman wasn't wrong when he said that it was sort of a referendum on economic plans, economic visions. He wasn't wrong in saying that, he was just wrong to say it well let's turn to oh well, we're deviating a bit from our uh taxathon uh theme but the the other uh bit of uh grief for the term of government this week well it came from uh their, their own uh, uh, respective party rooms. This was uh, the National Energy uh, Guarantee, where it's, uh, it, it's basically the, the reverse of a renewable energy target, just to remind everyone's memory, is that it aims to ensure that there's enough energy from baseload power, i.e. Uh, coal. Uh, now, there's a revolt from uh, Tony Abbott and his uh, other well, small group of backers, uh, Craig Kelly, Kevin Andrews, Erica Betts, uh, plus uh, a lot of the, the nationals who are threatening to, to cross the floor unless there is a new uh, investment, government investment in coal-fired power stations. Uh, so it's, it, it's looking like that this could be a rerun of 2009 when there was a revolt in the, the coalition uh, party rooms uh, about the uh, Rudd uh, emissions trading scheme because if if there's going to be Liberals crossing the floor and they've still got a one-seat majority uh, as it stands, then basically they're going to need Labor to support it and also uh, they're, they're also needing all the, the Labor premiers to uh, support it as well. Mm. Well, I wrote a very scathing note on it, as you know. Um, I refer to it more as a nil energy gimmick because of the simple fact that it's not... Unless they adopt the National Party MP's suggestions on adding on a mechanism to create a lot more usage of coal and gas, it's not going to... It's not going to guarantee our energy supply. It's not going to help build anything in terms of energy infrastructure. And we're all still, we're going to eventually end up sitting in the dark regardless. So, you know, we have this conversation now. In a few years, we might not be able to have it if they want to maintain the, if they want to maintain the um, commitment to renewable slash green energy. And uh, as you know, Labor has said, that if it's not green enough, they're not going to back it. But the chat, but the task for McCormack, the new leader of the Nationals and the deputy prime minister, is to be able to balance the wishes of his backbenchers along with the government's vision for the NEG. I. I, the whole technology neutral argument that Grant, Greg Hunt and others are saying, and Frydenberg are saying, I don't buy that for a second. Uh, if I hear the word energy mix again, I'm so sick of hearing <laughs> that term. It's basically the, the way that Turnbull and Frydenberg can basically try and have their cake and eat it too, saying, you know, we're for uh, renewable energy, we're f uh, for fighting uh, climate change, but we realise we've got to have this 
mix as well. But uh, so far, Abbott and uh, his uh, supporters, Albert, they're, they're, they're probably motivated by uh, other political factors rather than uh, just uh, sound uh, public policy. It's, it's, it's not being bought by them. Mm, exactly. And it shouldn't be bought by anyone, really. I mean, when you tie in the whole Snowy 2.0 scheme that they want to do, you're actually going to be losing power out of it. Uh, and that's uh, a huge problem. So many corny names. Uh, uh, 2.0 and then, of course, uh, uh, National Energy Guarantee. When something has guarantee at the end of it, you know, just... Uh, that's what's what they do in, in advertising. This is a uh, money back guarantee. Just uh, cringe. <laughs> well, that's what happens when you market too much. When you market policies for political points rather than policy for profiting the people, as it were. Mm. Your thoughts, by the way, on the fact that um, he wants to uh, Turnbull and Frydenberg and Hunt want to delegate the. Um, the decisions on the energy to the state premiers. I think it's a bad idea, personally. Don't get me wrong, I love federalism, but I think it's a bad idea. I think it's basically so they can do a bit of strong arming of the, the Labour uh, states and the states which have had such a reliance on renewable energy. I mean, South Australia has a uh, Liberal uh, government now. Um, uh, yeah, the damage Andrews, is already done. Yeah, Daniel Andrews is, as we know, very... Uh, left wing. It, it's it's basically they want to be the the savior of the the people in these uh, the, these states who don't like all this renewable energy. Saying we're going to make sure that we get there, and I'll use this term again, mix right. Uh, so so it's basically they're wanting to be the 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 savior here. That's and it also it, if they get all the the states on board, then it also locks. Uh, any future Labor government in as well. It's it's what we talked about before, locking uh, future governments into uh, your policy. And uh, of course, we know that Turnbull and uh, Greg Hunt, um, probably Frydenberg now, they're, they're all believers in um, uh, climate change and uh, 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 the, the electorate uh, still uh, buys the, the, the climate change arguments. So they all still feel they've got to do something politically. Mm, mm. Yeah, but I don't think I don't think the strong arming will work because even even let's say for argument's sake that enough of the prem, the Labor premiers actually say, you know what, this is actually a better idea than what we've currently got. They're still going to jack up the prices of electricity. The retailers will still jack up the electricity. They'll still be gouging the people because there's. It's going to take ages before the baseload energy guarantee, the baseload power can be increased. It's just. It's not feasible. The way that they want to do it is just not feasible. Yeah, it's. It's not my ideal policy. Obviously, I want to. Uh, unshackle the the energy market just get rid of all the the subsidies and uh, uh, all the uh, regulations that are geared towards uh, renewable uh, energy but I still believe that national energy guarantee it's still a reasonable flip uh, when it comes to energy policy it's too, it's basically two inches in the right direction. That's yeah. all it is, Tim. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, and I'm sort of of the the view that yeah, I'll take it. Because mm. <laughs> I know that Labor and the Greens are going to be much worse. I mean, look at Weatherall. He he still wanted to uh, ramp up to a a seventy percent uh, renewable energy target at the the last uh, South Australian state election. I mean. Uh, the blackouts didn't bother him at all. It probably wouldn't bother him. He's it probably wouldn't bother him at all anyway, because Adelaide's got enough power to run on reserve. Government buildings have their own reserve generators anyway. They don't care. I'm well, sorry. Did they say that out loud? That's <laughs> a little cynical. I'm sorry. <laughs> 
Well, uh, the, uh, the parliament is now in recess for the, the winter break, uh, which, i.e. all the, the MPs uh, go over, over to the Northern Hemisphere where it's uh, summer for their uh, study tours. That's what's meant by uh, winter break, but it's probably going to be for the next month a full-on uh, Super Saturday. And as you mentioned, we've got our, our live stream uh, that evening where we'll bring you uh, all of the results and uh, give you our analysis. Mm, indeed. So uh, I'll, I'll definitely talk to you uh, before then, I'm sure, uh, Michael, but uh, that, that'll be the main focus of uh, our coverage uh, for the next month. Fantastic. Thanks, Tim. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. Please make sure to grab your tickets for Stefan Molyneux and Lauren Southern's tour in Australia this July. They'll be visiting Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth and Brisbane, as well as Auckland. The tour is being hosted by new events company Axomatic Events, and you can book your place by visiting axomatic.events. Another big name who is coming down under is former UKIP leader Nigel Farage. He is coming down this September and also visiting Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth and Brisbane and Auckland. Tickets, including various VIP passes, can be booked at nigellive.com.au. Also, don't forget, if you want to take The Unshackled even further and score some awesome rewards in the process, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash theunshackled. Also, we have our online store, uprightmarket.com, where you can purchase Unshackled merchandise and other gear for right-thinking people. So thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentaries.